welcome to this Hexa X presentation on 6G radio requirements to support integrated communication, localization, and sensing. My name is Hank Weimers and I'm with Chalmers University of Technology. Listed here are all the collaborators of this work, which was presented at UCNC and the 6G Summit in 2022. HexaX has defined a large number of use case families and corresponding KPIs. You can find more details in the deliverable shown below. The use case families include massive twinning, telepresence, robots to cobots, trusted embedded networks, hyper-connected resilient network infrastructures, enabling sustainability, as well as additional evolving use cases as the project progresses. In order to analyze these use cases from a communication, localization, and sensing perspective, we have defined simplified use cases for each of the applications. For communication, we have considered very short-range wireless access, corresponding to very high per-user rate and short link ranges, and low very low latency requirements. We have also considered short-range wireless access, with reduced rate requirements, reduced latency requirements, but longer link ranges. Similarly, for localization, we've considered high accuracy positioning, low latency positioning, and low complexity positioning, where the names hopefully speak for themselves. These use cases, these simplified use cases, can be mapped back to the HexaX use case families shown in the middle column. Finally, for sensing, we've identified monostatic and bistatic slash multistatic sensing. Again, example KPIs are shown on the right. Now the question is, how can 6G radio support these KPIs? Clearly, 6G will rely on new enablers at the physical layer. These include millimeter wave, at least the upper millimeter wave bands, which have so far been underexplored, distributed MIMO and RIS. 6G will also feature tight integration among communication, localization and sensing. So location sensing information will support communication and vice versa. Now to understand how 6G radio can support these KPIs, we've taken the following approach. We have already shown the use case families, then distilled the simplified use cases with example KPIs. Now we will discuss the requirements and then from those requirements, hopefully we can propose an initial solution. We've broken down the 6G radio requirements into three different categories. Requirements on signals, on hardware architectures, and on deployments. In more detail, for the signals, we've considered the aggregate bandwidth, the waveform type, modulation type, and signal shaping needed to support the use cases. These are then considered in combination with hardware architectures, where we've considered the carrier frequency, channelization, as well as array type and array size. Finally, the signals and hardware architectures will be considered together with the deployments where we consider the placement of infrastructure nodes, the synchronization requirements, and then also the knowledge needed about the infrastructure nodes to support the use cases. It is important to note that there's many solutions in the sense that there are many combinations of the parameters that can support the KPIs. Let's consider an example. Suppose that we want to support 100 gigabit per second communication at 10 meter or 10 gigabit per second communication at 100 meter and we can play with the signal bandwidth or the hardware transmit power. The figure on the right shows the trade-off between the two. So the x-axis shows the transmit power per antenna and the y-axis the bandwidth overall and then the rate is computed based on the channel capacity equation in combination with the free space path loss. We see that, for instance, to support 10 gigabit per second, we can consider either a transmit power of 20 dBm per antenna at a bandwidth of about 1 gigahertz, or, for instance, a transmit power of about 4 dBm per transmit antenna with a bandwidth of about 4 gigahertz. So this shows that there's a trade-off between transmit power and signal bandwidth, and there's many ways that you can achieve the same KPIs. The same holds for localization. So now let's look at the localization example. We can, we can do localization typically using more than one base station by using time measurements. 
So the figure on the bottom left shows three base stations, a user device in a 2D environment. And from the time of arrival measurements from the three base stations, we can compute the time difference of arrival measurements and then localize the user on the intersection of several hyperbola. On the other hand, you can consider the scenario on the right, showing a single base station, which we here assume to be synchronized to the, to the user. And in that case, the user can be localized based on a combination of time of arrival, constraining the user to lie on a circle around the base station in combination with angle of departure which defines a line in 3D, or in this case 2D, away from the base station towards the user. The question is which combination is better? To partially answer this question, let's look at the figure on the right, where we show the performance of different, uh, in terms of different metrics as a function of distance between a base station and a user. So we see, for instance, when the user is further away from the base station, the rate drops because of path loss. But if you look at the ability to estimate distances or angles shown in the blue and red dashed curve, you see that even at very far away distances, you can estimate time of arrival and angle of arrival in this case very, very well. However, when you combine these two sources of information shown in the orange curve, the positioning quality at far away distances is really bad. And this is because a small error in angle estimation at a short distance leads to a small position estimation error, while the same small angle estimation error at a large distance leads to a large position estimation error. In this case, if we had considered the solution with delay only uh, measurements, then we would have needed several base stations, because each base station could only give us a circle or a combination of base stations a hyperbola. And the price we need to pay for that is tight inter base station synchronization. So again, there are many solutions to solve localization problems and to meet the target KPIs. So now let's revisit our question. What are the 6G radio requirements to support integrated communication, localization and sensing? Our approach has been to first look at the requirements on the signals. And again, as I mentioned, there's many ways that you can support the KPIs. So for instance, let's look at the bandwidth. We see, for instance, for very short range wireless access, there are different possibilities. A large bandwidth of 4 gigahertz or a very large bandwidth of 10 gigahertz, where the labels A and B refer to the combinations with the hardware and or the deployments. We see here, interestingly, that the requirements in terms of bandwidth are more stringent for the communication use cases than for the localization sensing use cases. This is something different than we've seen in previous generation of communication systems. If we now look at another column, the modulation, whether the modulation should be coherent or non-coherent, we see that for communication, in principle, we could live with either coherent or non-coherent communication and still meet the requirements. On the other hand, for localization and sensing, we need coherent communication links in order to exploit phase information, which is the main driver for providing accurate delay and angle information. You can do this analysis for all of these columns and all of these rows, but due to lack of time, I will not go through all of them explicitly. What is important is that there are some similarities between communication localization, localization sensing, some differences, and there's also typically different solutions that can support the same KPIs. Let us now look at the hardware architectures. First of all, for instance, the carrier frequency. Here we see that to support the high rate communication, as well as the requirements on localization and sensing, many of the use cases require very high carrier frequencies between 60 and 140 gigahertz. There are some examples or some exceptions. For instance, low complexity positioning can live with lower carrier frequencies as well as short range wireless access, and interestingly, also high accuracy positioning, provided that enough antenna elements are available. Second, like, let's look at channelization. For instance, here we see that channelization for communication is optional, so there could be channelization, while for localization and sensing, typically we do not prefer channelization because it breaks the phase coherence across the different bands. And finally, let's look at the array sizes here, for instance, at the infrastructure nodes. Here we see a big difference. 
So for communication, maybe 10 to 20 antenna elements are sufficient at the base station or the access point. For communication, while for localization sensing, we need many, many more, many more antenna elements. And this is really in order to provide sufficient angular resolution. Finally, let's consider the deployments. For instance, in terms of synchronization, we see that the synchronization requirements for communication are more relaxed than those for localization and sensing. The most extreme requirements for communication are enforced by distributed MIMO because you need tight timing and phase synchronization between the access points. This is not true for other communication topologies where the synchronization requirements are much more relaxed. For localization, as well as for sensing, in particular by static sensing, the requirements on synchronization are very, very stringent, with the exception of low complexity positioning. This is because a small synchronization error on the order of, let's say, a few nanoseconds quickly leads to errors in terms of distance estimation on the orders of meters. And if we want to meet those very stringent KPIs for localization, we need to pay the price of very tight synchronization. A similar story holds for the knowledge we need regarding the infrastructure. For communication, we need very limited position knowledge regarding where the act, where the, ins, the infrastructure nodes are. While for localization, we need millimeter level information where the access points are. This is because if we need to have centimeter level accuracy, we need to know at a millimeter level where our infrastructure is. The same holds for orientation information. For very high accuracy positioning, we need to know the orientation of access points or infrastructure nodes with sub-degree accuracy. Otherwise, very small angle estimation errors will lead to very large positioning errors. So in conclusion, what we've done is we've listed envisioned 6G envisioned six use cases and derived corresponding requirements on communication, localization, localization and sensing based on simplified use cases. We've then investigated the corresponding 6G radio requirements in terms of signals, hardware architectures and deployments through the, tr the three shown tables. What we found is that there's no unique solution. However, to support a combination of several use cases, what we would need is an aggregate bandwidth of around 10 or of around 5 to 10 gigahertz. And we probably also need carriers above 100 gigahertz. This is to satisfy the most extreme combination of use cases. We also need flexible multi-carrier waveforms and coherent communication. Next, we need the ability to shape the signals in space relying on analog or hybrid arrays with very large aperture at both the transmitter and the receive side. And finally, we need dense deployments in order to have line of sight links between the infrastructure nodes and the user devices, and also to have short links, which are most beneficial when we use angle estimation. Also important for localization sensing, we place very high demands on synchronization and calibration. In other words, to have extreme performance, you need this extreme calibration. This brings me to the end of this presentation. Thank you very much, and please follow our work on hexax.eu.